Hello and welcome to this week's TAB Telecast. I'm Pastor Timothy James Farrell and I serve as the founding and lead pastor here at the TAB. We hope you find this week's TAB Telecast both informational and inspirational. We also want to invite you to come worship with us some Sunday morning in person here at the TAB. The TAB is located at 1845 West Hubby Avenue in Normal, Illinois. And here is this week's message. up our, uh, our April message series entitled Five Star Families. Uh, we began by looking at um, the five star family certainly as a metaphor for what God has called every single Christian family to be. You know, God doesn't want us to just be a one star family or a three star family or even a four star family. God wants us to have prevailing, overcoming, blessed five star families. And so we, we looked at what that would look like. Uh, we followed up that message with five-star marriages. If you are married, you need to watch that message. You need to listen to that. I share with you five stars to having a five-star marriage. If you're not married, you need to listen to that message, all right? And, uh, and believe God for a, a godly spouse to have that kind of marriage. Last Sunday, we looked at five-star children. If you are a parent of a child, I mean a youngster, all right, you need to listen to that message. Today we're wrapping up the message looking at five-star teenagers, five-star teenagers. Now, if you are a parent of a teenager, if you've been a parent of a teenager in the past, or perhaps even you have grandchildren that are teenagers, uh, you know something about that, and, uh, and that is this. Parenting a teenager is one of the most rewarding things you will ever experience. And at the same time, it's one of the most frustrating things you will ever experience. Not given the day, given the hour of the day, it, it kind of depends on which one that is. It, it, like John Dunn said, it can be the best of times and it can be the worst of times at the same time. Can I get an amen from someone that knows what I'm talking about here today? All right. So parenting teenagers is not, is not always easy. It's difficult, but God hallelujah gives us good instruction and wisdom in his word as parents to to heed and to follow one such word is this that i want to really hone in and lean on uh, this morning is proverbs 22 verse 6. it says these words train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it so the time of training uh, children and teenagers is when they're in your home uh, it's almost too late when they leave the nest so to speak when they leave uh, the confines of your home and the guidance and auspices of your leadership notice the direction that God calls every parent to train their children or teenager and that is up train your children and teenager up in the way they should go as parents, we're called to call our children and teenagers up in life. In other words, set some goals, set some, some dreams, set some targets uh, for them to hit and to aim. You'll never hit a target you didn't name for. And I think sometimes in life we've set the bar too low, not only for ourselves, but for our children. Uh, there's greatness inside your child. There's greatness inside your children. And in, 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 there's greatness inside your teenager. Speak to them and speak up to them, not just down to them. In other words, challenge your teen to do and to be better than they currently are. Give them big goals, big aims, big dreams to achieve and attain in life. Tell them that you believe in them and God believes in them because that is the truth. And with God, all things are possible. I believe if we begin doing these things and other things like it, we'll begin to raise up teens in the way that they should go. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it this way about training children and teenagers. He said, train your child in the way in which you know you should have gone yourself. Well, that's wisdom right there. Train your child and your teen in the way in which you know you should have gone yourself. In other words, as parents, believe it or not, teenagers that you're here today, uh, we've learned some things. 
And sometimes we've learned some things the hard way, and we can save you some pain, we can save you some trials and some turmoils, if you believe it or not, we'll just listen to us. And we can save you some heartache if you would just, just go the way in which perhaps we didn't even go ourselves. The question is how? How can we train up our, our children and our teenagers in the way that they go? Because after all, they didn't come with a manual, did they? There was no manual, you know, given to you as a mom or dad on how to do this. Well, uh, I've got good news for you. The good news is this, is that God did. God gave us a manual, and that manual is the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The Bible is an acronym that stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Everything you need to know about life and godliness, according to the Word of God, is right here in the textbook pages of these 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. So take the Bible and use it as your, what, training manual or your teaching book, your curricula and curriculum to help raise your teenager up in the way that they should go. Deuteronomy 6 says these words, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to what? To observe, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, use the Word of God, the manual, as a teaching tool among a great many variety of topics and subjects that they will encounter in life from heartache to heartbreak to relationships to friendships to to whatever the, to health to wealth uh, to salvation to heaven to hell to conflict to forgiveness and healing whatever it is it's in the word and we just need to go to the Bible we just need to go to the textbook to find out how we can live the best life and how we can train our teenagers up in the way that they should go I challenged the parents last Sunday as I talked about five-star children to begin viewing and perceiving their children in a different way and that is this begin viewing and seeing them not just as children but as future adults I really want to focus that and say that again today to you parents who have teenagers in your house because that day that they is coming sooner than later uh, teenagers are on the porch of becoming adults responsible adults or irresponsible adults and and we need to begin seeing them especially in the last parts of 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 in times and days and years in our home as teenagers as future adults and we can begin training them to live successfully and to live godly in this carnal and fallen generation. Can I get an amen? Can I get a better amen? Amen. I tell you what, the word the Lord gave us again at the beginning of this series is this, is that, that uh, countries fall and rise, not just on individuals, but families. There's a reason the family unit is being attacked today by the devil. The, the, they're trying to do away with even the, the structure of what the Word of God says is a healthy and godly structure in the home. And, and all of this gender stuff and all this is an attack on the image and the purpose and the plan of God for our families. Because I'm telling you this, the country will rise and fall on the families. It does. It begins right there. And we need, to, we need to begin seeing our teenagers as future adults and begin instilling within them life skills to be successful adults, but even more successful and faithful followers of Christ. So what are the five stars today that we can begin applying and employing as parents while our teenagers are still in the house that will help them live in this world for the vast majority of their lives as adults star number one is train them to love parents the number one thing you can give your teen is a love for god 
And loving God is the number one thing any single one of us will ever do in life. In fact, there's no greater purpose and there's no greater goal according to God's own voice and God's own word than to love him. Deuteronomy says this, Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Strength. How many of you know that's pretty much everything? We're to love God with everything that we have. Jesus reiterated that in the great commandment of Matthew 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, for this is the first and the greatest commandment that we're ever to be about. What's the one thing you and I should be doing every single day if we don't do anything? Is loving God with everything we've got. Now, there's a second commandment, and Jesus says, and the second commandment is very similar to the first commandment, and that is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the first thing we need to be doing as parents with children and teenagers is training them, teaching them how to love God, how to love themselves, and how to love others. Because if we get that right, everything else will fall into place. In fact, if we went on and read verse 40 of Matthew 22, Jesus makes an interesting statement. After telling us what the great commandment is this, it's not up on the screen, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Jesus said this. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Well, what does that mean, Pastor Tim? That means every other commandment of which there are 969 commandments in the word of God. 969 thou shouts. And Jesus said, there's no way you're going to fulfill all 969. Not going to happen. You can't even remember 10. The top 10 commandments. Let alone 969. But Jesus said it this way. And I, I like the Cliff Note version. You remember Cliff Notes? Remember growing up? The Cliff Note version of the book was about 57 pages of of the book then it was 500 pages you can kind of just cut to the chase Jesus cuts to the chase he says if you'll love God if you'll love yourself and love others it fulfills all 969 you don't have to worry about lying and cheating and stealing and murdering if you just love God love yourself and love people you'll fulfill all the others it'll take care of themselves and that's what we need to be doing we need to be teaching reiterating and training them to love God, love themselves, and love others. How do we do that? The number one way, parents, I'm talking to the parents today, not just the teenagers, is to show them how. Don't just tell them, show them. Don't tell them you love God. Oh, well, all right, I'm going to go stepping on toes, pull them back. Here I come. Don't tell your teenager to love God when you don't love God. Don't tell your children to live for God and you don't live for God. Don't tell your children it's important to go to church and you don't go to church. Don't tell your children it's important to forgive others when they offend you when you don't forgive, parents. You've got to teach them and train them how to love God by doing it yourself. Because your example will always trump your words. I can't hear what you're telling me because your life is proving otherwise. You've got to be careful how you walk. You've got to be careful how you live. Now listen, let me talk to the kids and the teenagers. There's no perfect parent. Your parent is going to blow it some days, and other days they're going to get it right. Now parents, when you blow it, here's what you do. You talk about that. Say, so you know what, I kind of, blew it there I should have done this and I did that I'm human forgive me God forgive me and let's learn from that and you're teaching them you're training them what how to love God and how to love yourself and how to love others it's the number one thing that God has called us as parents to do is to train them to love that's the most important thing that's the core thing to this and if we don't do that all these other points and all these other commandments 
will fall short. The second star, write this down. After you train them how to love God, themselves, and others, train them to live. Matthew 7, Jesus said, In everything do to others what you would have them do to you. You train them to live, again, the same way you train them to love, you show them how to live. You're teaching lessons every single day, moms and dads, by what you do and what you don't do in life. And believe me, your children are watching and certainly your teenagers are watching. Train them to live right privately and they'll live right publicly. Correct them privately, honor them publicly. For the number one influence on a child is their parents for the good or for the bad. We talked about that last Sunday. And as you know, as, as children turn into teenagers, there's a shift in influence and in impact. When a child is young, the number one influencer and number one impactful person upon them is the parent, beyond a shadow of a doubt for the good or for the bad. But as your children turn into teenagers, you begin going down a slot or two. And friends begin to rise to the top of that. And I'm saying this, if you don't train them how to live, their friends will. And if they don't have godly friends, and if they don't have friends that love the Lord and love the things of the Lord, guess what? They'll begin to rebel, and they begin to stray from their faith. Train them how to live, moms and dads. Train them and instill within them godly values and godly priorities while they're young and reinforce them as they become teenagers. Now, parents, I'm going to ask you to do something which is going to go against every grain and every instinct within you as a parent, and that is this. Let your teen fall, let your teen fail, and let your teen flunk. Why? Because you know and I know as parents, one of our greatest lessons is in life is learning from our mistakes. They're painful. We're going to get bruises on our elbows and our knees and every once in a while some scratches on our cheeks and foreheads. But you've got to get your hands off of them. And you've got to begin letting them make some decisions on their own and learning from the good decisions and learning from the bad decisions. Applaud the good ones and don't condemn them for the bad because you're going to commit and you have already committed bad deeds and spoke bad words in your past. We learn from them and we use those as teaching opportunities in training them how to live and teaching them how to live. Many times in life, our greatest teachers are our mistakes. And what a greater time to learn from our mistakes for our children and teenagers is when they're in the safety of our home when we can use them as teaching opportunities in life when they fly celebrate it and when they fall use it as a teaching moment to try and to move on to something else one of the greatest lessons in life is learning how to rebound from our mistakes. Now let me clarify, people are not failures who fall or flunk. People are failures when they refuse to get up and learn from their lesson after they've fallen or flunked. Someone once said this, failures are people who refuse to get back up and try again. How many of you ever remember learning to ride a bicycle? You remember that? I mean, everything was fine and dandy when we were ch a child and had our training wheels on. Thank God for training wheels. When our children are three, when our children are four or five. But there's something wrong if you've got a 25-year-old and they still have the training wheels on. I've never seen a 25-year-old with training wheels. Why? Because there comes a time where you got to shed the training wheels and you've got to teach them how to ride the bike without the crutch of mom and dad always being there to catch them, the training wheels. 
And it's kind of scary. I remember that first time. I mean, my land, one second I'm doing great with the training wheels. They took those things on, and all of a sudden that bike went mad. I mean, that bike was going everywhere. That, I mean, it was wobbly. It was, it was gone. I was like, what? This thing's possessed. And they got behind me, you know, had the hand on the seat, hand on the, get, got me started. Okay, now, here we go. Go for it. And it wasn't about five feet, and I went, boom. And I crashed, and I burned, and I didn't want to ride a bike ever again. But guess what mom and dad did? They said, hey, that's how it is in life. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to flunk. Get back up. We're going to try it again. You can do this. That's where you start training them up. You start speaking up. You got this. You can do it. And, and you went round two. And maybe I went ten feet. And then I fell the other way. And then they put me back up. And I went thirty feet before I fell. And the next thing you know, I'm riding around the neighborhood without any training wheels. Why? Because my parents let me fail. My parents let me fall. It's an important lesson we have to teach our teenagers in life is this. You got to go for it. You got to go for it, and you got to be willing to fall. You got to be willing to fail. You got to be willing to flunk. In life and use them as teaching moments and teaching opportunities to get back up because if you would study the great men and women of God in the Bible along with the great men and women of God in history here's what you're gonna find out most of the 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 the, the champion stories the good stories of triumph and victory we hear that but we don't hear about all the times they failed before all the times they tried and, and flunked before. Can I give you just some examples? Think about Abraham. We think about Abraham, the great mighty man of God, the father of faith. He failed numerous times. He made some major bad decisions. Two times he gave his wife away. And, and said he, he was his sister. But God used it. And God used him. How about Moses, the great deliverer of Israel? If you talk to a Jew, who's the number one prophet in Israel? The number one prophet in Judaism is Moses. He wrote the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses is the man. Can I talk to you about Moses? Moses was a murderer. How many of us would, would welcome murderers to stand behind the pulpit and preach? and tell us how to live for God. Very few. Yet the number one Jew, the number one prophet of God is a murderer. Now, he didn't stay a murderer. He asked for forgiveness. God taught him and trained him up, amen, and changed him, amen. And God made him a tremendous success. How many of you know anything about a telephone? How many of you like using the telephone? Alexander Graham Bell fa failed thousands of times before he figured out how to make a telephone work. Thomas Edison, the light bulb, thousands of times. He tried thousands of different theories and different uh, formulas to come up with the light bulb. Thousands. And then he got it. Moms and dads, are you willing to work with your children and teenager and say, listen, it's okay. It's okay to fall. It's okay to fail. It's okay to flunk. Get up and try again. We've got some softball players in the church today, some teenagers. We talk with hope all the time. When you get up to hit, you get up to take, you get that bat in your hand, you get in that box, you're there to hit. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's the goal. In fact, I played baseball most of my life. The best part of the game is hitting. But you never hit a ball you don't swing after. If you're going to hit, you got to swing. And here's the reality. Sometimes you're going to swing and miss. And sometimes you're going to swing and miss and strike out. 
That's the game of softball. That's the game of baseball. In fact, you want to hear the qualifying batting average for the Hall of Fame? Are you ready for this? That you succeeded in hitting three out of ten times. If you can hit the ball three out of ten times, you're in Cooperstown. The last time I counted, that means you failed seven times out of ten. We put people in the Hall of Fame that hit the ball three out of ten times. You hit the ball four out of ten times, you're a legend. But see, we don't talk about the failures, right? Striking out in baseball and softball, it's just a part of the game. You don't quit the game because you struck out. What do you do? You learn from it. What did I do wrong? How did I miss that ball? You go back, you figure it out. Because here's the thing, in the next inning or the next two innings, you're going to get another opportunity to hit the ball. That's how it is in life. Come on, how many of you have ever failed in life? How many of you ever tried something in life and flunked? How many of you ever fallen in life? You did something, you went for it, and you fell short. We all have. We all have, but you don't quit. You don't quit. You teach them to live. This is a part of life, and you get up, you dust yourself off, and you try again. Someone say, try again. Try again, try again, try again. Star number three, train them to steward. Talking about five-star teenagers today. There are three things, and I've taught on this before. Three things in life God has asked every single one of us to steward. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. Three T's. Time, talent, and treasure. That's all you've got in life. You've got time, you've got the talent that God gave you, and you've got the treasure that he gives you. We have to teach them to steward time, talent, and treasure. For this message, I want to specifically focus on treasure. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Parents, teach and train your teen how to make money, how to manage money, how to save money, how to share money, how to spend money, and how to steward money. Listen to this, God's way. I don't care what the world has to say. What does the manual say? Because this is the manual that God's given every single one of us for life, and nothing in the world, and I don't care how smart the economist is, can ever trump the Word of God. There's nothing greater than God's Word, because God knows a thing or two about money and about riches. I'm amazed at how many people, even in the house of God, in the kingdom of God, struggle financially. In fact, today in America, I think the latest poll is this, upwards of 60 to 65% of Americans today, as I'm preaching this message, are living paycheck to paycheck. And maybe that's you here today. If it is, you need to really lean in and listen to Pastor Tim when I'm getting ready to share with you. That's not what God wants for us. God doesn't want us living paycheck to paycheck. That's far beneath where God wants us to be. I can preach an entire series of messages and prove to you God wants to bless and prosper you in every area of your life, including financially. God wants us to be blessed financially in order to be a blessing financially. And most people, let alone Christians, have never been taught biblical economics. And how are your children and teenagers going to handle money when they get it is dependent mom and dad on you and the training you give them you teach them how to steward the money that god gives them while they're in your house because here's the reality what you and i do with a dollar we'll do with ten dollars we'll do with a hundred dollars we'll do with a thousand dollars and we'll do with a hundred thousand dollars you know you and i there's lots of poor people in this town amen not a whole lot but there's some and a lot of them are panhandling and begging for money. And it's not, there's nothing wrong, my friends, with giving somebody that needs a dollar bill a dollar bill or a $10 bill a $10 bill. But here's the reality. You and I can give 
that person a hundred thousand dollars and we think okay well that's going to solve poverty it's going to get them off the streets and everything like that they will blow through that money by the end of the month and they'll be back on that corner panhandling why listen to this not because god doesn't want them to bless they haven't received the teaching they don't know how to steward the resources that god gives them there's a very simple principle that every single one of us can remember and employ and specifically parents teach our children on how to manage money God's way. Can I give it to you real quick? I believe it'll be a blessing to you. It certainly would be a blessing to them. It's called the 101080 stewardship system. You've got a dollar, break it down into 10 cents increments. The first 10 cents that you have of that dollar is for the purpose of sharing specifically giving God 10% of your annual gross income that's called the tithe the tithe is 10% it's the first 10% before you do anything with that dollar the first 10 cents goes to God it's the training wheels of, of Christian biblical stewardship 10% it's the one thing God asks of every single person it's interesting, and I've taught you this, God never asked for a certain amount from any of us. He asked for percentages. So in other words, he's not going to ask somebody that makes $10,000 a year to do and to give anything more than someone that makes a million dollars. He asked the millionaire to give 10%, and he asked the poor person to give 10%. It's the same. It's the first principle. And by tithing, it's interesting, it aligns us for the blessing of God to be poured out into our lives financially tithe the first 10 percent you give it to God you're recognizing him as the source and you're asking him to bless it and to use it for his kingdom building purposes and advancements in the earth because here's the truth it takes money to do ministry and it takes more money to do more ministry can I get an amen amen it does teach them the first thing you do is you give to God you recognize God blessed you with that job God bless you with that paycheck he is your source and you're returning the tithe back to him for his kingdom building purposes the second 10% is save teach him to save 10% right off the top the first thing you do give to God and then you give to yourself Invest 10% of your gross income into yourself. Whether that's investments, stocks and bonds, savings account, whatever. Diversify. <laughs> Take 10% and give it to yourself. And store it up. Not just for the future, but for when God taps on your shoulder and says, Hey, I want you to give $1,000 to this person. Or I want you to give to this cause at the church. Or I want you to meet this need of someone. That way you've got money. You've got resources for God to use and to bless you and, and, to, and to bless others. And then the last is the 80%. And that is spend. Pay 80% of your gross annual income to your bills, to others, to meet whatever needs you might have in your life. If you'll just do this, 10, 10, 80, I guarantee you your finances will be blessed and will align with the will and purposes of God. Most people, if we be honest with you, I had everybody raise your hand. How many have ever heard of this? Raise your hand. Most people have not. Most Christians have not. Why? Because most pastors are scared to death to preach about money. Well, because, you know, we all kind of start looking at the carpet. No. I tell you what, this is an important message. Because there's no burden and there's no worry like the lack of money if you've ever had more bills at the end of the month and you've had money you know what I'm talking about and it could put a strain on a marriage it could put a strain on a mom and a dad when you've got marry, uh, money problems than almost any other reason we've got to get it right and we got to here's the thing we got to help our children teach our children now while they're teenagers before they leave the house and begin working for themselves to get it right so they continue to be a blessing 
and to continue to be blessed by God. Star number four. The fourth star is to train them to obey. Now, unfortunately, in our day and time, we consider the word obedience to be a bad word, a dirty word. It's almost a curse word. But if you really read the Bible, the manual, we want to know the key to blessing. The key to blessing and abundance is obedience. I've said it this way for years, and I'm going to say it again. Only the obedient are blessed. And parents, you don't bless your children unless they're obedient. Because here's the truth, and please lean into this. What you and I reward will get repeated. Whatever you reward will get repeated. Whatever you allow and applaud and, and give privy to will get repeated. You reward obedience and you discipline disobedience. Can I get an amen? You don't reward disobedience. And you don't permit it. There's consequences to disobedience. And they better learn that lesson while they're in the house. Because they're going to learn it in life. This is craziness what's going on in America right now. All this lawlessness. I've had it up to here. Lawlessness is of the devil. Disobedience and anarchy and riots and anti-whatever, Semitism and racism and prejudice, it's of the devil. And we better stop rewarding it and we better stop allowing it because whatever you permit and whatever you reward gets repeated. Can I get an amen? It's insanity. Read Deuteronomy 28. Write that down next to the, this point. I didn't put it up on the screen, but just read Deuteronomy 28. And then you're going to need to take some Advil. <laughs> God only blesses the obedient. He only blesses the obedient. So what am I saying? Please listen to this. Here it is. Moms and dads, you know what we're really good about doing? And this is sad. I mean, Really? And grandmas and grandpas, you know what we're really good about doing? We're really good about catching our children doing something wrong and disciplining them and punishing them. We're almost looking for it. Let's change that. Not that we shouldn't discipline disobedience. I'm not saying that. How about do this? How about catch them doing something right and applaud them and reward them for it? I mean, just be so ecstatic. Good job. When was the last time your child heard you say good job? Way to go. That was awesome. Do that again. Reward obedience, discipline disobedience, because that's what God does. And he, dis he disciplines the disobedient, please listen to this, out of love for us. If you've ever been disciplined by God, it's because he loves you enough to discipline you, to correct you, to get you back into obedience because God knows something you and I don't know. He won't bless the disobedient. He only blesses the obedient. Colossians 3 verse 20 says this, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. We need to teach our children, train our children to obey, to obey us, to listen to us. And in so doing, there is a blessing. Now, the word mean, obey means this. To abide by, to adhere to, to execute, carry out, comply, and conform. That's what obedience means. And here's the deal. When you and I do that, even in our relationship with the Lord, when we just, we, I grew up singing an old song in the church called Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. See, I don't need to know all the details of my heavenly father. I don't need to know all the circumstances and how he's going to work it out. You know what all he asks of me? Just trust me. Just obey me. I got your best in mind. I got your best in heart. I'm not going to trick you into doing something that's going to bring casualties and harm and hurt to your life. Just trust me, God says. Just trust me and obey me and I'll take care of the rest, and I'll bless your life. 
and I'll take care of you and your children and your children's children after you. Just trust and obey. And moms and dads, we need to be people of character. We need to be demonstrating that we love our children enough that they say, listen, you don't need to know all the details. Just trust me. Just trust me. Just obey me. And in so doing, you'll be blessed. Exodus 20, verse 12 says to children and teenagers, honor your father and mother so that you may live a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do you know that's the first promise of God in the Word of God? The very first promise of blessing to any of us children is this. When we obey our parents, that blesses us. They'll live a long life. Why? Because we're training them how to love and to live and to obey. Proverbs verse 1, or chapter 1, should say verse 8 and 9, says this. Listen to your father and mother. What you learn from them will stand you in good steed. It will gain you many honors. I shared with you last Sunday four ways to receive an education. Remember that? You can learn from others. You can learn from yourself doing things the hard way. Or you can learn from what? You can learn from teachers and you can learn from authors. That's how you learn in life. That's how you receive education in life. And we can save ourselves a lot of time and heartache not just as teenagers, but certainly as adults, by listening to the wisdom of others. One of the things that I've done in adulthood I wish I would have done more of when I was younger is this. Whenever I set out to do something in life that I've never done, I always go to people who've done it, and I ask them this question. I call them up, I email them, I write them, I have lunch with them, and I say, hey, listen, um, I'm getting ready to do this, and I know you're already doing this. If you were me, knowing what you know, what would you do? They go, oh, I can save you a lot of heartache. And they say, I would do this, this, and this. And I'm like, thank you. You know, many years ago, God called me to write books. I had no clue. How to write a book? None. I mean, I wrote a dissertation for my doctorate about 25 years ago, and that about killed me. And when God told me to write books, and then a few years ago, God called, called me to write a book every month. He called me to write a book every month for five years, and I did it. You write a book every month for five years, and see how that goes for you. And I thought, and I told God this. I said, I have no clue how to do that. You have set me up for failure. And he said, well, why don't you call this person up and that person up and talk to them and ask them, since they're writing books, how do you write a book? So I did. And they taught me how to write a book. Now, I can write books like you make chocolate chip cookies. It's easy. Why? Because I went to somebody wiser than myself, and I learned from them. And, and they taught me. And I obeyed. And now I'm writing books. Amen? That's just an example. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, and the NIV says this. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Can I get an amen from all the moms? Can I get an amen from all the moms? So dads and moms, you're responsible for what? For training your children up in the way that they should go. It takes both of us. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Let me talk to every teenager in the house. You would be wise to listen to your mom. You would be wise to listen to your dad. Believe it or not, they're not the stupidest people on planet Earth. They've learned a thing or two. I know you think they're dumb, but they're not. It's amazing how smart my mind and my mom and dad uh, uh, became on my 25th birthday. I thought, man, you guys have really grown up. When I was 13, 14, 15, 16, I thought, dear God, help me. You put me in the home of the dumbest parents on the planet. I was shocked how smart they became. 
they hadn't changed, I changed, amen? So listen, listen to them. They do know what they're talking about, believe it or not. Star number five, I conclude with this. Talking about training teenagers in the way they should go today. Train them to associate. Boy, this is an important one. The word associate literally is defined as this, to join in friendship, partnership, or company. You better train them who to hang around with and who not to hang around with. You better talk to them about choices that you made that were good and choices that you made that were bad in regards to the people that you allowed entrance into your heart and life. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says this, Walk with the wise, and you'll become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Can I get a really good, loud amen from my mom and dad to know what I'm talking about? Y'all can preach this message right here. I mean, just hand over. In other words, who you hang around with matters. Who you associate with matters in life. Not just as teenagers, but as young adults and as adults. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. It matters. It matters who their friends are. Moms and dad, it matters who our friends are. It doesn't mean we don't love people. It doesn't mean we don't try to reach people and be compassionate with people that are bad for us, maybe wrong for us. Amen. If we didn't do that, we'd fail at the Great Commission. Last time I read the Great Commission, Jesus called us to go to all people, even those that are spewing hatred out towards Him. But just because God's called me to reach you doesn't mean you're in my inner circle. Doesn't mean you're, you're, you're going to influence my heart, my life, my mind, my health, certainly my future. In other words, we better vet people. We better interview people. We better see demonstration in word and deed, in character and in conduct before people gain, I'm talking about close proximity to us in life, amen? The older I become, now when I was a child and I was a teenager, I had, my land, it's a good thing I didn't have Facebook back then or social media, I'd have had thousands. The older I become, there's very few people in my life. Very few. I'm talking about close close people that that impact my life. I can count them on one hand, those people that I associate with. I'm talking about fellowshipping and doing life with that really speak into me and I speak into them. Call them best friends, call them whatever you want, confidants. The older you become, and I think every parent would probably say, yeah, that's probably true of me too. There's very few people. I got just maybe one, two, three, at the most five. If you've got five, I think you've got too many that are close to you, that their words carry weight. And we need to teach our teenagers, listen, you better be careful, be cautious of who you really allow close to you and to your heart because it matters. It matters. People will either fly with the eagles or flop around with the turkeys. If you want to fly with the eagles in life, guess who you got to hang out with? You got to hang out with the eagles. And if you're called to be an eagle and you've got a bunch of turkeys around you, they will keep you on the ground. The turkeys will grab you as you begin to fly and to soar and to live out for those things and those will and purposes and visions and dreams that God's put in your heart and they'll pull you back down. Let me ask you to vet the people in your life today by simply this. Are the people in your life today, I'm talking about the close proximity people, are the people in your life today the wind beneath your wings calling you up to soar in the heights of life? Or are they the weights around your ankles pulling you back down? Watch this now. To their level. Because turkeys are always intimidated and threatened by the eagle. 
I had to cut some people out. Y'all know this. We got an exit door over here. Sometimes you got to walk people out with the kindness and love and compassion of Jesus Christ and walk them to the exit door of your life and say, I love you enough to let you go. We can still be friends, but we're not going to be best friends. We can still, you know, say hi and all of that, but your, your, your influence is finished in my life. Bad company corrupts good character. In other words, it matters who we surround ourselves with in life, moms and dads, and it matters who your children surround themselves with in life. And ask them, listen to this, and all this is helping them learn to discern whether someone's good or bad. Because it can cost them. It can cost them not only time in life, but it can cost them their life. I know people have gotten in cars with the wrong people and didn't make it home. It matters. And I've done way too many of those funerals because the right person got in the wrong car. You've got to teach them. You've got to train them doesn't mean we don't love them doesn't mean they're not kind to them it just means we're not going to hang out we're not going to do life together one of the wisest things moms and dads we can do in conclusion is this ask for help because here's the thing i've learned about parenting three teenagers myself it can be hazardous to one's health Parenting teenagers isn't easy. It's not for the faint of heart. Now, some are easier than others. But here's the thing. Don't parent teenagers by yourself. Ask for the aid and assistance of other people, other godly people, to come around them, to speak into them, to reinforce the Word of God in them. People like your lead pastor. People like your youth pastors. Godly uncles and godly aunts. Grandmas and grandpas. Sometimes coaches. Sometimes it can be older siblings. This is the thing I've learned about teenagers, and if you've ever parented a teenager and seen them graduate into their 20s, you know this to be true. Sometimes you can say, the same exact thing as somebody else, they'll turn a deaf ear to you, but they'll listen to them. They think you're dumb and they think they're smart. You can say the same thing. Eat your vegetables. And they'll think you're crazy. And they'll think Uncle Pete is the smartest person that ever walked the planet. So don't be afraid. To ask for help. I thank God for our youth group. I thank God for, for Kat and for Brian as our youth, youth group leaders here at the church. Why? Because they are speaking life. They're speaking positive. They're speaking courage and dreams and visions into them. Just like we are. And they're helping us together to grow our children and to train our children and our teenagers up in the way that they should go what are the five stars to raising five-star teenagers here it is again in summation number one train them to love train them to love God and to love themselves and love others number two train them to live train them to live right in a world that for whatever reason is applauding wrong number three train them to steward time talent and treasure God's way Star number four, train them to obey. Number one, obey God and obey you. Obey the laws of the land because only the obedient are blessed. And the fifth and final star is train them to associate. Train them to associate with people that love God, love them, and love God's call and purpose in their lives. Parenting isn't easy. Parenting children isn't easy. Parenting teenagers is even 
more difficult. But you can do it. You can do it. God's given you His Spirit to do it, and God's given you a church to aid and assist and to help you do it. We're here for you. We're here for you. Because I'll be honest with you, as I conclude with this, give me another 60 seconds. I've got to choose my words carefully here. And get that camera on me here, Brian. What is happening in America right now ought to stop every single one of us in our tracks. What is going on with the young people in our country right now and the anti-God language and the anti-Christian language and the anti-Semitic language should scare every single one of us to the core. And if we don't put an end to it, we're going to lose the next generation and we're going to lose this country. There are two countries, listen to this, and I'm, I'm very serious here. There are two countries out of the hundreds and thousands of countries in the world today that the enemy, and I'm talking about the devil and all his demons and fallen angels, are trying to destroy. And in the halls of, of countries this week and last week have said these words, death to America and death to Israel. And I am flabbergasted that we are allowing those words to be spoken off the lips of people in our country. And that ought to stop every single one of us as Christian parents and say this message matters and if we're going to save America and if our children and their children and their children's children are going to grow up in this country and have any hope of doing what you and I are doing here today, the freedom of religion, because the, the enemy, I'm telling you, is out to stop this thing and certainly to stop preachers from let me like preaching. So what am I saying? I'm saying the hope of America is right here in our church. The future of America isn't just on our shoulders, moms and dads. It's on the shoulders of our teenagers and our young adults. And we have to assume the responsibility. We need to grab the reins that God's put in our hands and train up those that God's entrusted to our home and our heart to live for God, to stand for God, and to stand for godliness in not just America, but the world. Someone say it matters. It matters what we're doing. And don't take it for granted. And it's not going to get any easier. It's not. We're going to have to stand up. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be made fun of. And heaven forbid if we're, we might even be imprisoned. But if so, so be it. I'm going to stand for righteousness. I'm going to stand for godliness. I'm going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to stand for this book and the teachings of this book until God either comes for us in the rapture or calls me home to be with him. It all begins, moms and dads and teenagers, by opening your heart's door to the love and leadership and lordship of Jesus. We have every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you're watching me online and you've never asked Jesus to save you from your sins and to come into your heart and life, it's the most important thing you'll ever do. Above all these other teachings and do's and don'ts, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you're not right with God today, you can get right by simply drawing a line in the sand today and inviting Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. If you're here this morning and you would like to know God, you would like to be saved from all your mistakes, all your rebellion and disobedience and sin, would you pray this prayer with me today, inviting Christ to come into your heart and life? Say these words out loud. Dear God, 
I come before you this morning, a sinner in need of your grace. Forgive me of all my sins and come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. And help me live for you all the days of my life until you call me home to heaven. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together?